So welcome everybody. I'm Guy Martin, I'm the Executive Director at Oasis Open, and we're an international consortium that helps organizations build great open standards efforts, and more recently, open source projects. Uh, I'm very new here, I'm entering my seventh month on the job, and my goal has been to bring the experience uh, from open source communities, which is where my background is, into the organization and marry it with what is the tremendous reputation and experience that we have at Oasis in the standard world. Uh, and what I'd like to talk to you all today about is finding ways to bring the best of open source and standards together in support of the greater public good. So with that, let's get started. So we have to kind of acknowledge it. Let's face it, 2020 has been a really, really tough year for all of us. Um, and I'd like to actually start with this challenging example for a reason. I think it it's really actually very valuable to illustrate the importance of open source and open standards. It's probably also not an example you'd think of when you're considering software technology code or, or standards. In 2020 alone, the Western United States, primarily California, where I used to live, Oregon, where I live now, and Colorado, experienced um, over 8,400 wildland fires, which burned 5 million acres, resulting in you know, a lot of homes, 9,500 homes, probably more than that lost. And unfortunately, as of this presentation, 41 lives lost. I think we can all agree clearly, clearly these are grim statistics, but in the face of this tremendous tragedy, I think there are some great examples of the incredible resilience, determination, and great use of technology and standards. Before moving to Oregon two years ago, I had the honor to serve the citizens of California for 10 years as a CAL FIRE volunteer. And in this time, I helped build our volunteer communication staff where we were responsible for deploying our communications command post vehicle to wildland fire incidents. And I learned some important things during this experience. Because fire agencies band together to fight these kinds of large wildfires, multiple agencies would often fill up at the same incident. Now, the good thing is we were able to rely on the APCO P25 digital radio standard to communicate efficiently and provide safety critical information quickly, which allowed our firefighters to do their jobs of protecting life and property. However, as these myriad fire agencies came together, often they brought radios from different manufacturers, which presented an issue when these agencies needed to have us reprogram large sets of radio frequencies. And if you've ever been to a wildland fire command post, the amount of frequencies that are in use on, on fires this size is tremendous. And we had to reprogram all of these radios that were brought in so that these fire agencies could talk to each other using this P25 standard. However, because there was no standard for writing radio data to different radios, other than just serial communications, each manufacturer had written their own proprietary software, which slowed the process of programming and cloning these radios. Often we had to have several laptops, or if we only had one laptop, we'd have to switch between software programs, potentially deal with, with serial uh, contention and all sorts of issues that really were, were quite problematic. If the manufacturers had instead all contributed to an open source implementation conforming to a standard, they could have easily provided a critical tool and shared the cost of developing that software. In short, in a situation like this, there was really no competitive advantage to be gained from proprietary radio programming software, and quite honestly, many things to be gained by standardizing. So the benefit of coherent standards and the corresponding open source implementations is not unique to safety critical situations like wildland fires. I believe there are many areas of our lives that could significantly benefit from better integration of standards and open source. So though I primarily have experience in the open source world, I also helped companies create open source program offices and, and strategies. And I have some small experience with working with organizations like the Open Connectivity Framework, which was something that was developed to help provide a, an abstraction layer for IoT uh, networking standards. I, was, I helped start up that while I was at Samsung. And this organization was one of my first experiences with what I've come to call the open development ecosystem, which is really being, bringing the best practices of open source and op open standards together. However, despite my experiences with CAL FIRE and the OCF, I wasn't always a convert to standards as a way to move technology forward. So, <laughs> you know, 
I, to illustrate this, I'd like to acknowledge the elephant in the room. And uh, from people in my open source community, when I went to Oasis, this was kind of the big elephant in the room because it's, it's how open source communities today sometimes still view standards and standards organizations. And really, I think it's about different perspectives. You know, I'm sure we've all seen a variation of this comic or heard people talk about standards in this light. And I have to admit that early in my career as an engineer, I mistakenly thought that open source and working code was the only path forward for everything. And I think there are still a lot of people in the open source community that unfortunately feel this way about standards. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to give this talk because I believe education about the role of open source and open standards working together is critical as we move forward as a society in addressing the ton of issues that are before us that technology plays a role in. So rather than view open source and open standards as adversaries, let's talk a little bit about how they can come together to deliver better outcomes. If you consider the historical background, you'll see that standards activities came to live primarily with legal departments, usually after there was some patentable or valuable intellectual property bubbled up to them from the product or engineering teams. And open source software didn't always make that same journey. And sometimes the IP around it was deemed less important than the outcome of, of actually building the code um, that provided some functionality. And you know, in doing research for my new role here at Oasis, what I realized is that the desired outcomes of both open source and open standards communities are the same. It's really for them about interoperability, choice, and innovation. Where these communities differ is in how they approach getting to these outcomes. And I think despite these differences, they actually have great commonality in what they're concerned about, usually issues of governance, how use cases are defined, and how they actually approach and get to consensus. So in practice, what, what I found in my, my short time here at Oasis is that fast open standards group, and I think Oasis is one that does exist that can help organizations create open standards in a fairly rapid way, usually work really well with solid open source projects that have a very good idea about their governance and sort of understand how to, how to actually move things forward. And as a matter of fact, the goal of the open pro projects program that we have here at Oasis is to help bring together these two different kinds of communities, because we believe that there's tremendous value in both approaches, both the standards approach and the open source approach. And we think that this is true for both the technology creators and the consumers of those technologies. As part of the goal of educating both of these communities, open source and open standards, I think it's important to consider what I call the hidden gems of collaboration that have already been happening with open source and open standards for quite a while. You know, code and standards have never really been strangers. For example, the Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, has been building networking standards based on the notion of rough consensus and running code for quite a while. Our colleagues and friends at the Open Source Initiative, OSI, have created the open standards requirement which is a list of criteria for helping make open standards more easily implemented as open source. And at Oasis, even before our open projects initiative, many of our standards groups would create their own open repositories on GitHub or <laughs> way back in the day before GitHub existed on SourceForge to provide sample code and or to provide implementations for critical parts of the standard. You know, another area that, that Oasis has tried to help with is in raising the bar on what we call open standards, standards that are freely available. And you know, contrary to popular belief, only a fourth of a percent of our standards that have been issued over 25 years require royalties to be paid. And we think this is a great example, and this is something that we also believe is really critical to breaking down that barrier between a specification and its implementation. You know, the, we think that the synergies between open source and open standards happen in one of three ways. Sometimes the standard comes first, as is in, in the case of UBL, which is an open standard for electronic uh, invoicing widely adopted in Europe, which gener generated many local profiles in the different countries uh, and regions in Europe, a lot of different regional public projects and open source tools. And sometimes the code comes first. So this is an example that hopefully a lot of you have heard of. Star Office building software, which enabled royalty-free office document spreadsheet and presentation software. This later then became the open document format and progressed from an OASIS standard to become an internationally recognized standard with ISO. 
Sometimes these communities and these efforts form in parallel, like in the NQTT standard or messaging, message queuing telemetry transport. Well, I can't say that five times fast, <laughs> which is a standard for an industry protocol for lightweight IoT sensor and device coordination. And that was complemented and developed alongside Eclipse's open source project like PAHO. The nice thing is that as these develop in parallel, these two teams feed each other improvements. And honestly, this is what I saw with the open um, connectivity framework as well, an open source, an open standard that was feeding an open source reference implementation and vice versa. One slide too far. So if you still don't believe in the importance of the convergence of open standards and open source, can you imagine today's world, the world we're living in right now without the internet? In the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, the internet and virtual communications have literally become our window on the world. We're all having this conference right now because of those technologies. And for those of us who were accustomed to a commute, our homes have now also become our offices. Some may say that's good or bad, depending on whether you have kids like I do who are in, in homeschool. Most of us were used to shopping online, but now we're also shopping for groceries and having them delivered to our doorsteps. You know, the majority of us have also cut the cord with the convenience of streaming entertainment services during this time. We're meeting with our doctors virtually, our children are attending school virtually. And you know, from TCP IP to HTTP, SAML, XML, JSON, and many others, none of this would have been possible without the seamless integration of open source and open standards. In short, the internet's impact on our daily lives really has never been more profound. So I think we've established that open source and open standards are critical to each other for a lot of reasons. With that, let's kind of explore the core areas of open development in preparation for looking at some current projects that are making a big difference in our world using this open development ecosystem. You know, Today's technologies are, technologies are more interdependent than ever, and de facto standards, whether they're open source projects or not, don't always give buyers the confidence that the tech that they use is going to be interoperable. The trade-off for the modularity in open source is perhaps a lack of wide interoperability, which can oftentimes drive up short and long-term development costs. And interoperability, so the, the standard side, without modularity is lock-in. A converged open development ecosystem really gives more choice to everyone. And one of the other big challenges, as you saw earlier in the, in the coming together slide, is finding a way to bridge the intellectual property gap. It's usually the thing that comes up most often when we talk about governance issues between open source and open standards. And bringing a balance of protecting the differentiated IP, which is very important for organizations that you know, are, are building technologies that they want to use to differentiate themselves, bringing the balance of protecting that differentiated IP while allowing and encourage, encouraging support for non-differentiated IP and standards. For, so all of the things that you build your, that, that are part of the core that everyone needs to use and shouldn't be developed over and over again. Um, and finding a way to, to allow that code to be freely given to important technology efforts, whether those efforts are source code or specifications. Uh, there are some projects that I'm going to talk about in a second that are doing a great job, I think, of using their major API interfaces as really the bones for starting the specification work. And it's a great place to begin, begin to provide a convergence between the open standards and the open source community. And finally, it's really important to provide good neutral guidance with all the potential roadblocks between these, these communities in, in this world. And this is a critical role of open source and open standards foundations and consortiums like ourselves at Oasis and others. So we've talked about some of the historical projects and I think many of which continue to be the underpinnings of our technology world today. But let's turn our attention to some newer projects that I think are providing examples of the proven ground that's happening in open source and open standards today. So the first one of these that I'd like to cover is an OASIS project called the Open Cybersecurity Alliance, which is really building an open ecosystem where cybersecurity products interoperate without the need for completely customized integrations. 
And if, as you can imagine from the, the window on the, on the, on the world slide, the, the world that we're living in today is even more dependent on online tools. So cybersecurity takes on an especially important and critical role. The efforts for the OCA consist right now of three projects. The Stick Shifter project, which is an open source library allowing software to connect to data repositories and exchange threat information using the Structured Threat Information Expression Standard, or STICS. And STICS is really a structured language for describing cyber threat information so that it can be shared, stored, and analyzed in a consistent manner. The OpenDXL ontology is a project focused on the development of an open and interoperable, interoperable, I shouldn't have had more coffee this morning, interoperable cybersecurity messaging standard for use with the OpenDXL messaging bus. And OpenDXL provides an open source implementation of the data exchange layer, which many vendors and enterprises already utilize. And it delivers a simple open path for integrating security technologies, regardless of who the vendor is. The last project is NIST SCAP. Uh, NIST has built a suite of specifications for exchanging security automation content, which is used to, to do automated configuration compliance and to detect the presence of vulnerable versions of software in your stack. And this same SCAP content can be used by multiple tools to perform audit these automated security assessments. The OCA project is developing a proof of concept code for the SCAP effort. I think what's interesting is all of these efforts are combining specifications with open source implementations to allow more seamless sharing of this critical cyber threat security information. The next project I'd like to talk about is the Baseline Protocol, also an, an Oasis open project. And it's an open source in initiative that combines advances in cryptography, messaging, and blockchain to deliver secure and private business processes at a low cost over the public Ethereum mainnet. However, the nice thing about, about blockchain is that it also can be potentially used on other distributed ledger technologies to help provide secure verification of those blockchain transactions without having to know a lot about what's in the what's in the individual systems that are kind of in each each um, uh, entity's uh, uh, infrastructure. The protocol enables confidential and complex collaboration between between enterprises without leaving any sensitive data on chain. So this is a very very important thing. And Baseline is doing is one of the projects that I think is doing a great job of using their API references as the bones or basis for their specification. And this allows them to have separate but cooperating communities for, to feedback critical contributions to each other. And an interesting note in our current COVID crisis is that Baseline has been meeting with the mobile industry in an attempt to help make contact tracing APIs and functionality more private and secure by using this Baseline protocol. And Baseline, I think, is a really, really great example of one of the first Oasis Open projects that's taking advantage of processes that we've helped develop to help guide open source developers into easily creating specifications that are useful outside of the initial open source implementation. The slides keep slipping back. Okay. The third project I'd like to talk about is the Open Services for Lifecycle Collaboration, or OSLC. This is the community that's striving to pull together a lot of diverse initiatives focused around application integration solutions that allow you to collaborate and partner with each other rather than compete. And there are many, many organizations with different backgrounds that are sharing their version of what an integrated engineering environment looks like. And sometimes they're promoting different ap approaches than what OSLC and, the, and other linked data solutions provide. But I think the goal of this community is to openly discuss complementary approaches, which can also be appropriate to the goal of improving the overall viability of standards and implementations for, for supporting these, in, these engineering industry integration challenges. Now, this project combines a set of open source libraries that allow the interchange of information like IoT systems, PLM or product lifecycle management, 3D data, and other data sources with some corresponding specifications that allow for greater interoperability and testing in this world. And there are a lot of different companies that have already implemented significant parts of OSLC into their products and op operations, including Honda, So, so Daimler, AT&T, and Rabobank. 
And we're actually really happy to say that at Oasis, this is one of the first open, um, one of our first open projects efforts that's actually gone from code to, to actual project specifications. So it's a great example of, of how that process has worked and how we're working to continue to bridge that gap between open source uh, efforts and standards efforts. So while there's already great work going on in this convergence between open source and standards based on the examples I've shown, I'd like to turn our attention a bit, <clears throat> excuse me, to the opportunities that are still out there for the open development ecosystem. So I think this pandemic has really changed everything from the way we approach our day-to-day -day life to how we look at our future as a society. And honestly, there's never been a better time for a closer synergy between the public sector and the private sector in creating technologies for the greater public good worldwide. I think there's still plenty of room for differentiated and proprietary technology. However, creating silos of information that lock away critical data based for things like pandemic response or life safety data or other things, it's simply not sustainable for us as a society going forward. Governments and the technology sector can oftentimes have an uneasy relationship where mutual trust is a hard thing to come by. You know, it's in this context that international standards and open source organizations also need to step up and partner with each other and the public sector and tech sector. So organizations like Apache, ourselves at Oasis Open, IEEE SA Open, the IETF, HL7, which is a health standards organization, and the ISO, provide these neutral forums and guidance that help achieve agreement on critical on supercritical technologies for our society. Specifically, partnerships between all of these groups should be used to bootstrap new collaborations that drive not only value, but also increase the common good. So now let's take a look at some areas where this could be prioritized based on our current situation with COVID and the future challenges that we face. So obviously, based on my first slide in my description, you should um, probably have figured that emergency response was going to be one of the ones that I highlighted. Um, I think it's a critically important area that we need to continue to invest in, both in standards and open source implementations. There's already great work going on here at OASIS and in other places, but specifically at OASIS and our Emergency Management Technical Committee, which is the home of CAP, the Common Alerting Protocol. So if you've ever gotten a weather alert, if you've ever gotten an AMBER alert in the US for a missing child, the underlying technology and standard for that is CAP, the Common Alerting Protocol. But there's also work going on for things like hospital availability, how many beds are available in a current regional hospital and other related standards in this area. Additionally, the AS4 OASIS standard is currently being used in Europe today to help build COVID-19 data exchanges. So these are really, really important things that need to be addressed. However, even these great open standards need good open source implementations. And I think this is an area where public and private partnerships have traditionally not been as strong. And it would be great to see this flourish going forward as we start to think about what our ongoing response to future pandemics and future crises might be. Yeah, slides are just jumpy today. As a parent, um, this one is near and dear to my heart and probably to many of you as well. I think really we're, it, we're definitely in infancy of this area right now. And, you know, I think we've done a great job adapting as a society and as a technology sector with technologies like Zoom or Google Meet or Google Classroom, but they've kind of all been cobbled together. Uh, it hasn't been a seamless experience. And, and I know I'm probably not the only parent that's seen that seems this has not been a seamless experience. And you know, I'm very fortunate that I work in tech and have been an engineer for most of my career. So I've been able to help, help my kids with this, but I can't imagine what this is like for the average parent that you know, probably doesn't have a huge amount of technology experience. So figuring out how we build better standards to do things like exchange, exchange assignment data, coordinate schedules. And you know, we have calendar standards, but being able to actually utilize those in a, in a consistent way to coordinate uh, school schedules I think it's going to be really, really important going forward. 
um, providing reliable and integrated teleconferencing. So not just Zoom cobbled, cobbled together with other things, but really finding a way to build an integrated set of standards and platforms to actually make remote learning viable for everybody is going to be critical going forward. And I think even after our students are, are able to go back to in-person learning, this is a critical moment where it's important for us to consider what education is going to look like in the future. I think the silver lining that COVID has given us is an opportunity to reimagine what education can look like. And it could be a combination of in-person time with the flexibility of remote learning for some subjects or segments that don't require in-person attendance. I think it's safe to say this will not be the last pandemic or medical emergency our world's going to face. I think now is the time to start building standards and open source implementations that we can build additional functionality on. And even if that means proprietary add-ons that are interoperable and correspond to a standard. I think it's really, really important that we do this to, to further safeguard our children and our society. So if the storms and wildfires have taught us one thing, it's that climate change is a situation we need to deal with. However, I think far from just being the morally right thing to do, this, is, this presents, again, like the remote learning, a unique opportunity to reimagine what our economy and our world can look like longer term. So things like the UN's Green Economy Program or the European Commission's Green and Circular Economy are going to require technological investments at both the standard and open source levels. And there's already some promising efforts underway in areas like the Linux Foundation's LF Energy effort, which helps with control, automation, virtualization, and the orchestration of supply and demand in the energy grid. And while tackling this from the code first perspective is good, I think there's clearly long-term benefit to building the associated standards that can work with the energy and, uh, and other sections of the green economy and taking all these projects that are currently being housed in places like LF Energy and also helping build standards around them. So other areas of the green economy that we need to be looking at include things like waste to energy and recycling management, sustainable urban development and transportation. And I'll point out here that, that there is a project or an effort going on within OASIS, one of our foundation as a service efforts called the Open Mobility Framework or OMF. And I think it's a really, really interesting way to, to reimagine what urban development and transportation looks like as we support the greening economy. And also energy efficient construction. Ecological building is a growing market. Uh, prior to Oasis, I was at Autodesk, which is doing a lot of work towards figuring out how to make buildings more energy efficient and how to make planning for whole cities and, and, and whole um, urban areas a lot more efficient and a lot more green. There's a lot to do in this space, and I think it's critically important that we find creative ways to partner with all the stakeholders. Again, I think partnerships are a huge part of this, partnering with all the stakeholders to make this happen for our future. So as I close today, and we're going to have plenty of time for questions, which I, I like. I'd like to leave you with some points to consider for how we can all move the needle on the convergence between open source and open standards. I think there are four areas that are critical as we move forward. The first one is education. It's important to continue to shine the light on the great work already being done in efforts to combine open source and open standards. We need to educate people about the value of open source and open standards working together. We need to educate consumers, I think especially in government, about how to properly shop for solutions that offer both good standards and open implementations and to help demystify open source in these really highly regulated procurement pipelines. I mean, there's a lot of great work going on in government and open source, much more than in the time that I helped start the Forge.mil effort in the Department of Defense. There's, I was just seeing today that the NSA, a sponsor of ATO, has code.nsa.gov. So they're doing some great work in open source. We need to continue to demystify open source in these highly regulated procurement pipelines. We need to educate businesses and developers to consider building both an open standard and an open source implementation when it's appropriate. Collaboration is the next one. We just need to make it easier for standards and open source communities to collaborate. And this is not just in sharing code and ideas, 
or asynchronous communication, but in providing real guidance around intellectual property, process, and governance practices that allow both communities and their users to reap the benefits of the great minds of both open source and open standards. The next one is partnerships. And some may say, hmm, partnerships and collaborations look like the same thing. But in this case, I think it's about bringing together the stakeholders that I mentioned earlier, the public sector and the private sector in partnerships with foundations and consortiums like Oasis and others to help bootstrap efforts that provide technology for the public good. Foundations and consortiums, I think also need to learn to, a little, to be a little bit better at partnering with each other, especially in areas where we have complementary and not competing technology agendas. And I'm happy to say that Oasis actually has great, great relationships with organizations like HL7 and ISO and ITU. And I think it's one of the reasons that I wanted to come here is I saw Oasis as an organization that was taking the partnership efforts seriously. And partnering to build common guidance on these things I mentioned, process, IP, and governance would be a great place to start, right? So I think there's a lot of expertise in, in these, these standards and open source organizations around these common areas of process, IP, and governance. And it's time for us to partner with each other to find ways of kind of giving those, those guidance and, and that those areas of, of help in a very common way. And lastly, it's about impact. I think we all need to step back and think about impact. What's the impact of the technology, business, or implementation decisions that we're making? Are we making short-sighted decisions strictly in the name of profit? Are we considering how we can balance the need for shareholder value with positive impact on society? And I know personally, as a technologist and leader, these are things I think about every day. Understanding our larger impact on society is going to be critical going forward. You know, I think open source has changed the world in a lot of positive ways. And to continue to be effective, it needs to work at a whole new level in cooperation with open standards. And you know, while open standards has clearly been the bedrock of technology that we've all come to rely upon, including all the technologies we're using to have this conference, open standards needs to fully embrace open source to push better, more interoperable solutions forward. And I think with both sides, with this whole coin, hopefully we can make a lasting impact on society's most critical issues. So with that, thank you very much. And I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Guy. It was such an interesting talk. Thank you once again to be a part of ATO. Um, yeah. yeah, we definitely have a good time for questions. And I see in the chat a couple of questions from Lawrence. And then there's a question in the Q&A. So just following along the <clears throat> Uh, sequence. Let's go with what Lawrence wants to ask. So do you want me to read the question or should we allow Lawrence to speak his, uh, his question? Either one. I, I would love to have the interaction with the audience if they're happy to sure. if they want to speak with the question. Sure. Yeah. Hello. Hi, hey, Lawrence. Um, so I don't, uh, let's pretend that my camera is not working because it's not working, but I, that's okay. <laughs> Um, the, so basically I was gonna, I want to talk about another time about the, the, your, 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 um, experience with the connectivity project, because I'm doing research on, uh, IOT standards and with the Eclipse found, I talked to the Eclipse foundation, uh, last week about their standards and the Linux foundation and, and try to figure out what, what the, how that collaboration is working out, mm -hmm. but um, the what I guess my question is for all those projects in in, in uh, for Oasis Open, are they mm -hmm. all net new projects? Were they uh, yeah. OSLC was one that we converted from one of our tech technical committees or our standards side of the house. And I know Chet, Chet Enson, who is our chief community standard uh, steward, is actually here on the, the session with us. But I know we commuted, we uh, converted OSLC to an open project. The other two are net new. Um, um, go on. Yeah. And then two, two similar questions is, um, is, OS, is Oasis open a 501c3? Yeah, and so yeah, there's some confusion there. So we're actually in the middle of a rebrand right now. It's one of the first things I, I did as we came on board. So mm -hmm. Oasis and Oasis Open are the same thing. 
um, we're actually going forward to going to refer to ourselves as Oasis Open. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a 501c6, so we're member driven. So mm -hmm. we've got foundational sponsors like Cripsoft and IBM and, mm -hmm. and Google and others are not, Google's not a foundational, but other uh, organizations that basically pay memberships to help drive the open source and open standards efforts. Mm -hmm. And then on the standard side, I think it were a little bit different than maybe other uh, SDOs or standards definition orgs in that all of our standards, as I pointed out, with the exception of like a fourth of a percent um, are royalty free. So basically the, the, the um, money is paid up front by members to help develop these standards, which are then, which are then royalty free and available what, for everybody. What standards organizations, which major standards organizations collect royalties? Oh gosh, I mean, there's, there's, you know, uh, there's ISO, uh, they, but ISO really is about the payment for the, uh, for the standard stock themselves. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's uh, it's kind of almost everybody else that we've seen, um, you know, has some form of either payment for the for a copy mm -hmm. of the standard or or depends on the, the implementation. Um, if you want to pay for the implement to be able to do the implementation, I think uh, one of the things I saw at Oasis is that, yeah, because it really is a very flexible organization will allow will allow reasonable and non discriminatory or RAN based standards, but it's a very small percentage of our portfolio. And uh, and you're creating foundations as a service as an offering is that correct yes we actually kind of have three i didn't really want to talk to, i'll happy to talk about oasis i didn't want to make it so much about oasis in the presentation but yeah we have we have um kind of three, three major offerings or four major offerings right now um technical committees which is the standard side mm -hmm. uh, open projects which is the open open source efforts and we're actually in the future going to be merging those two into kind of a combined projects or projects what we're calling project or projects offering we also run technical advisory groups when asked for ISOs or, or tags, mm -hmm. and then we have a, we have an, an offering called Foundations of Service, which basically, if you want to come in and run a foundation with your own charter and own rules, you can come in as a five hundred one c six sub foundation under so, our our umbrella. Let's see if someone else has other questions, because um, as you can tell, I'm interested in this subject. I could talk more about it. So yeah, I'll, I'll give someone else some more time. Sure. Sure, thank you, Lawrence. Um, let's see if we have one question in the Q&A. Um, quite a long question, yeah. So the, the question oh, is- like a licensing question. Yeah, it's a licensing question. Oh boy. So I will say, I'm reading the licensing question and anonymous attendee, I will, I, I will start off with, the, with my standard disclaimer of IA, IANAL, I'm not a lawyer. Um, with that being said, I think what's interesting is that um, you've got permissive, uh, sorry, I should, sorry, Roseanne, I'll actually read the question because you're right, it didn't come up. Um, a further schism in IP licensing is permissive open source licensing, i.e. MIT, MIT or BSD3 versus copy left open source licensing, GPL, CC by SA. Any thoughts on whether open standards should go in the direction of permissive copy left, neither both or something else for IP covered by the standard? And how does that affect participants ability to develop differentiated IP? Um, this is a huge, huge minefield. And unfortunately, I don't have uh, Jamie Clark, our general counsel on the call. But I will just say that it's one of the areas that you really have to think about, right? Because if you, if you allow permissive licensing or copy left licensing on a standard, then you, yeah, you probably are going to get a lot more um, maybe implementation or, or adoption of that standard, but at the risk of, of you know, potentially having uh, large organizations not want to participate because of that viral nature, right? I mean, we all, we all love and appreciate the GPL for, for what it's done, but um, you know, it took, I think on the open source side, I know it took organizations a long time to kind of get past some of the, the, the um, how do I say this? Some of the challenges around GPL, um, and, and you know, the Linux kernel is one thing, but I know when I was at Samsung, we had GPL uh, challenges around device drivers and tablets, for example, and 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 it was challenging for the organization who's developing that differentiated IP to kind of want to do that. So I think you have to be really, really careful on the standard side because I think if you you do that you know, you're going to potentially um, diminish the number of large organizations 
scientists that want to contribute to that standard. Now, at the same time, you also have to find a way to balance that. And I think it's important. So I'll, I'll give you an example, OCF, the Open Connectivity Framework, what we did in the licensing around the, the, uh, the uh, brand standard there was say, if you, each organization that's a member of, of OCF, as they're going through the, the standard definition, there was a period of time where they could say, and I think they got one or two of these a year, where they could raise their hands and say, okay, wait a minute, that reads on a patent or IP that I have, that my organization has, and we're not comfortable with that being in the standard. Um, and we kind of did that as a way to give them an out to, to say, hey, you know, that's, that, that's just a bridge too far from us, for us from an IP standpoint. But in reality, uh, I think that was that, that clause was used once in the time that I worked in OCF, which was a, which was a couple of years. We had one organization say, "Hey, that's just a, there's some patentable IP in there that we're not comfortable with being in the standard." But you know, I, I think for the most part, when you when the organizations come together for the right reasons to build the standard, they're hopefully building a standard that that they're going to provide additional differentiated IP on top of. So the the licensing of that standard itself, you know, probably should be um, not 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 uh, on the permissive side. So hopefully that answers the question without getting me in too much trouble about the fact that I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, let's see if you have any more questions. I don't see any more questions though. Oh. Yeah, couple okay. more left. Yeah. yeah, any 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 other questions or comments? Happy to talk about this. And and Lawrence, we can we can connect later if you excuse me, if you want to have a larger discussion about this. Right. <clears throat> okay. Well, awesome. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, I was really grateful to uh, to have a, a small audience that you know you have a have a, a more intimate discussion with. So Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your conference.